It often falls to the books and other media surrounding the Star Trek shows to expand upon, explain, or even retroactively add continuity – retcon events. This has been status quo for some time now, and has led to a myriad of stories classified as beta content. This content adds a lot of stability, depth and rationale to the universe and narrative of Star Trek, but exists in a sort of maybe, maybe not state, like Star Wars Legends material after the Disney Order 66. Hi, Rick here and today I'm looking into the beginning of the Kelvin timeline and why it may look so different from the Prime timeline, other than licensee agreements. The Kelvin Divergence is the origin of an entire universe that span off from the so-called Prime Timeline of Star Trek continuity. Centred around the destruction of the USS Kelvin, NCC-0514, in 2233, the event was nonetheless instigated by events of the Prime Timeline in the year 2387. The event itself is explained in the 2009 film Star Trek, but leaves a lot to be desired. In short, a supernova in the Hobus system destroyed Romulus and Remus, the home of the Romulan Star Empire. A vengeful Eric Banner, called Nero, attempted to enact said venginess on Spock, who had failed to save his home. In the ensuing firefight, Spock and Nero's ships fall back in time to 2233. Well, Spock actually arrives a little later, but irrelevant. Nero comes across a Federation ship, the USS Kelvin, and destroys it, setting events down a radically different path and creating an alternate timeline. Here is where it falls to the aforementioned beta content to fill in the pieces and explain things, like why a supernova wiped out a system light years away. Sure, radiation may travel that far, but that's not radiation! That's a big wall of fiery explode. That topic has been covered fairly well in the past by different lorehounds. I myself go into great detail about the actual event as explained in Star Trek Online, but if you want a quick summary, you could check out this video from Kedwalski. It's about a year old now, but tell him I says hi. No, the topic for today's video is why the universe ended up looking so different from the Prime one we saw in TOS, TNG, the other films, and so on and I don't just mean 43 years of differing film techniques. So, according to the Star Trek graphic novel Countdown, the Hobus supernova was detected by numerous powers of the Alpha and Beta quadrants, Starfleet, Vulcan, and Romulus among them. And with the new Picard series alluding to Picard being affected deeply by the destruction of Romulus, Looks like the writers may be drawing inspiration from the novel. Anyway, Ambassador Spock was the only one who theorised that the supernova would result in the destruction of major star systems, and no one else believed him on the principle that that's not how supernovas work. Frankly, an understandable approach. In response to this, he teamed up with Nero, a Romulan who had borne first-hand witness to the unstable Hobus system. His ship was the Narada, a simple mining vessel that looked quite different from the one we see on screen in Star Trek. Ultimately, Spock fails to convince the Vulcans to lend him the Red Matter research, Nero blames Spock for wasting time, and the worst happens. Hobus explodes. Nero makes it back in time to watch Romulus get engulfed by fire, and manages to rescue only the Romulan Senate, who escape ahead of any major populace from the planet. Through them, Nero learns of the rally point set up for emergencies such as this, a cloaked space station deep in Romulan space called the Vault. This massive construct is comparable in size to a fleet yard or a small moon, and has been the origin for much of the Romulan research and development for many years, Thaleron research and Borg tech being the big two though they also express interest in advanced cloaking and other useful inventions. The station is under the command of Commander Despal, who sympathises with Nero's anti authoritarian notions, and in the absence of the Senate – Nero flushed them into space – she allows him to dock the Narada in the vault's expansive interior, as she is finally able to conduct whatever radical experiments she likes with no governmental oversight. 
she introduces repurposed Borg technology into the Narada, grafting large weapon spokes onto the humble ship. What's more, this technology is adaptable, as it is rife with nanomachines, so it serves to literally grow and shape the vessel as desired. In Nero's case, he wanted a warship. Despal calls it the point of the sword and allows Nero to leave to test its new capabilities. This is also the storyline that Star Trek Online incorporates into its narrative, and Starfleet itself has always expressed an interest in understanding Borg tech because of its numerous formidable applications, so I don't find the notion that Romulus was experimenting with it too all that strange. If anything, I doubt they'd just ignore such a tactical advantage. Looking at the Narada now, it never states in the films that Borg technology was present, but just look at it. It ticks all the right boxes. Internally, it's cavernous and wrought from black metals with deep green glows from inside the vessel. The Moor-like design is sharp and looks like exposed machinery, yet despite its appearance, it's far more advanced than most other starships. It spent some time in the Prime timeline on an escapade of destruction before being sucked into a singularity created by Red Matter and Spock. Everyone in the Prime timeline who bore witness to this concluded that Spock had died collapsing the supernova, along with Nero, and marked the incident as the final heroic act of a Starfleet legend. So now we reach the divergence of timelines as Nero is plopped back out into the year 2233. The USS Kelvin, en route back to Earth, is diverted to investigate the strange emissions the emergence is causing, and we get our big alteration to history. The Kelvin was destroyed in the fight and the Narada skulked away to await the emergence of Ambassador Spock some 25 years later. During those years though, the ship engaged other powers, such as the Klingon Empire, but mostly Nero just bided his time however, though enough detailed scans were taken from the Kelvin's encounter with the Narada, and later encounters that made their way back to Starfleet. So a lot of the technology the Narada had was able to be studied in great detail. The encounter with the Narada would resonate with those in Starfleet Command, who believed a more militaristic approach was needed when patrolling the stars, and they were able to leverage the idea that there were powers out there that dwarfed the Federation into making some subtle changes to Starfleet. To be honest, this is understandable. Look what happens in the year 2365 when Picard and the Enterprise D encountered the Borg for the first time. After their reveal, Starfleet immediately commissioned research and specialty branches to develop counter-Borg initiatives, leading to characters such as Commander Shelby, and two years later, after Wolf 359, Starfleet literally began churning out warships like the Defiant class, the Sabre class, and re-evaluating its policies about maintaining a civilian presence on starships. In short, it became far more militant in response to a bigger threat, after that threat demonstrated a significant power gap. The same thing happened in the now increasingly alternative Kelvin timeline. Starfleet ships became larger in scale as they were crammed with more technology. You could argue the Enterprise NCC-1701 ended up so big when compared to its prime timeline counterpart because although the technology they created based on the Narada scans was superior, they couldn't downscale it enough to fit in the original constitution frame. Just look at real life, the miniaturization of technology takes time. In fact, the Enterprise of the Prime Universe was launched in 2245, but the incursion caused by Nero sent the team that were designing the Constitution class back to the drawing board and chose to develop a larger alternative concept to be the Federation's new pride and joy. They basically took one look at the data recovered from the Kelvin, looked at their blueprints for the Connie, paused and went, we're gonna need a bigger boat. These extensive redesigns included much of what had been learned from the Narada's alien technology, and meant that the Constitution line ended up being delayed for 13 years, 
being launched in at 2258 instead, replete with a crew who had now lived radically different lives based off of a different Starfleet, a different Federation. We see new designs for warp cores, uniforms, almost everything began to take on a different tone from the Prime Universe that it could have been, and the repercussions only escalated with time. Section 31, for example, a secretive clandestine organisation within the Federation in the Prime timeline, received far more funding and received Starfleet recognition in the Kelvin universe, although it was still secretive. After all, it operated on the premise that in extreme situations or in the face of extreme threats, the policies of the Federation became more flexible. By the time Vulcan was destroyed in the Kelvin universe, Section 31 had all the motivation it needed to greenlight internal projects such as the USS Vengeance, the most un-Starfleet Starfleet ship ever made. All this began with the introduction of technology from the future into a time it didn't belong, in the form of the Romulan, Borgified mining ship, the Narada. So that's the impact that one event could have. As for the difference in designs pre-Narada, well, there's numerous theories, I just chalk it up to creative choice, at least the uniforms and the like made allusions to the original material. But there are theories that say that when time was altered, it was less like a split and more like a bending of the timeline, so events before and after the incursion were changed. But that has way too many implications that make my head hurt. And by the time of Star Trek Beyond, the Federation was beginning to try to reassert itself as an exploration-focused force, about betterment, not just defence, and it had finally instituted the five-year missions that the original series was known for. So it's not like the lessons learned over the last 170 shared years of Prime timeline history were lost, just the aesthetic. The Kelvin universe just learned its lessons about the bigger threat a lot sooner than the Federation of the main continuity. Just look how visually different the Prime universe looked after its encounter with the Dominion. Anyway, thanks for watching. This is a video I wanted to make for a while now, but I was spurred on by the recent news from the Picard series, about which I speculate here, shameless plug, my progress through Star Trek Online also plug, and the fact that I finally obtained a copy of Countdown for myself to read. But that's all for now. Like I said in the intro, a lot of this is beta content, but it's usually the job of beta content to tidy up after the main event, and only an idiot doesn't give the cleaning staff their due, so I'd like to think it's relevant. Thanks for watching. I've been Rick, and until next time, goodbye.